love surround me, you might begin to be my guide. Shine, shine. So please join us in the spirit of meditation and prayer as we deepen into our service and share our opening words for this morning. Come into this place with your whole self, the parts that are raw and exposed, the part that is beaming with joy, the part that is seeking the truth, the new, the possibility. Come into this place, open your heart, lay down your burden, lift up your hope for something new to happen. Come into this place with fellow travelers on the journey. Some faces new and others familiar and all welcoming you here. Now, to this moment. Come, let us worship together. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May the flame light the way for all who seek such abundance. So our speaker this morning is Betty Mills, one of the founders of this congregation. She has a rich history with this faith, and if you haven't had a conversation with her yet, I would encourage you to do so. She is a very interesting person. I have two readings this morning. The first one is familiar, I'm sure, to all of you by Robert Frost. Uh, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it, it bent in the undergrowth. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. My second reading is by Somebody that I will read from later, too, his name is Lauren Isley. He was a, a naturalist, a famous, as a matter of fact. This is from The Immense Journey by Lauren Isley. The story of Eden is a greater allegory than, allegory than man has ever guessed. For it was truly man who, walking memoryless through the bars of sunlight and shade in the morning of the world, sat down and passed a wandering hand across his heavy forehead. Time and darkness, knowledge of good and evil, have walked with him ever since. It is the destiny struck by the clock and the body in that brief space, space between the beginning of the first ice and that of the second. In just that interval, a new world of terror and loneliness appeared to have been created in the soul of man. For the first time in four billion years, a living creature had contemplated himself and heard with a sudden unaccountable loneliness the whisper of the wind in the reeds. Perhaps he knew there in the grass by the chill waters that he had before him an immense journey. Perhaps the same foreboding out of a crowded room and st still troubles the hearts of those who walk out of a crowded room and stare with relief into the abyss of space so long as there is a star to be seen twinkling across those miles of emptiness. Perpetually now we search and bicker and disagreed. The eternal form eludes us, the shame we conceive is ours. We are one of the many appearances of the thing called life. We are not its perfect image, for it has no image except life. And life is multitudinous and emergent in the stream of time. The other day I was pursuing a book full of advice about how to keep your brain functioning. A timely read, I figured, for somebody with a brain as old as mine. And as I was nodding my head in agreement with great frequency until I turned to, the, till I turned to chapter two and the operating sentence proclaimed that the Bible was the greatest book ever written. That is not, of course, an original contingent and questioning such a statement should be approached very cautiously. Teetering at the edge of blasphemy, I personally think the Bible could use a little editing. Obviously, I'm a biblical amateur, although I have read the entire book several times, including one at the insistence of my great old Swedish uncle. I asked him, because he was known in the family as an expert on the Bible, I asked him if he really believed that anybody lived to be 900 years old. 
he backed me against the living room wall and screamed for what seemed to me an interminable amount of time, telling me that I would believe every word in the Bible is true or I would burn in everlasting hell. This was from a frail old Swedish bachelor who often didn't talk loud enough so you knew what he really wanted was the salt and pepper. And when I was a student at Mary College, I took a course in the Old Testament. It was taught by an elderly Benedictine monk whose specialty was biblical archaeology. It was interesting, and while it failed to shake my soul, he did capture my interest on the opening day when his question in, in uh, was a very interesting English because it was heavily tinted with the French. So that I did, I was been, I had been in the class, I suppose, two months before I discovered agriculture was agriculture. And the nun who used to sit next to me said, I couldn't understand why if we were studying the Old Testament, he kept referring to Luke. Well, he was saying, Luke here, Luke there. <laughs> anyway, his opening sentence to this class was, did Abraham ever exist? So I figured I was gonna like the class. So what does, what shivers my religious timbers? Obviously, these sudden grand moments would simply to be human and share with others some evidence that there is hope for humanity after all qualifies. But so unexpectedly can a beautiful North Dakota sunset, a grandchild smile, there's lots of things that shiver my timbers. Most often, though, I find it in words, spoken, encountered in print, and my most prolific source for such inspiration comes, of course, as you might guess, through the Unitarian Universalist Church in its many manifestations. And I'm grateful for those special religious experiences. They are a big plus, but it's not something I expect to wallop me on Sunday morning with any regularity. What I want and need for my religious experience on a regular and ordinary basis is guidance and inspiration, answers, questions, the ethics of living, and the freedom to pursue all of the above. In addition, I need a challenge to my role and obligations as a citizen of the world and as of my own community. And underlining and enhanced by all of that is sharing it with others. Or so it states on the back of our morning's program that I am, quote, grateful for the religious pluralism which enriches and ennobles our faith, end quote. So that's why I'm here on Sunday morning whenever possible. I had, of course, first to deal with whatever was in my head and heart from my growing up years. As many of us have, I attended Sunday services every, Sunday school every Sunday morning, in my case, in the Congregational Church. My father would drive us in, my mother would stay home and make Sunday dinner. I thought as a kid that it was a glorious arrangement. And he would, he would drop us at church with a nickel tied up in the corner of my handkerchief. And then he went down and bought the Chicago Tribune and sat in the car and read it until we were through. And that was our Sunday mornings. And then as I grew up, when I was home from college in the summer, I sometimes played the piano or that ridiculous old pup organ for Sunday services for adults. It was home, a place of familiar music and friendly faces, but it was no place for questions. Questions are something, something that I took to my father, who was a devout follower of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I have a, a very tattered, very small little pamphlet that I found in his stuff one day he kept it in his pocket because I would see him take it out every so often if he was stuck somewhere and he did it past time. It was Emerson's essay on self-reliance, which was my dad's favorite of all the essays. My dad was a Unitarian. He didn't know it at the time and neither did I. I was 26 years old when this fellowship was established. And I discovered my religious home, a place for the questions and sometimes the answers, a place where I was free to disagree, but more often to be inspired. Sometimes it was something said in the pulpit. Often it was a suggestion, read this. So of course I did. I'm forever reading things that people say, read this. I'm gonna get that history book and read this. 
but it was how I came upon Lord Isley's book, The Immense Journey, one of the sources of this morning's readings. Isley was a native of Lincoln, Nebraska, and I believe he eventually belonged to the Unitarian Church there. And it was Charlie Stevens, the minister of that church, who suggested I read Isley's book. Charlie has actually been here. He came here in one of our ministerial searches. He came as representing the denomination. And he also was known. He was on the national board for uh, American Civil Liberties Union. He went, was at Grand Forks in February for a meeting, which he then proclaimed to be as close to the end of the earth as you could get. <laughs> Isley was a Nobel award-winning scientist, and he was a naturalist. A naturalist. And the paperback I read was published in 1956, and I probably read it in the late 60s. I rediscovered it in the year 2019 while looking for another quotation by him, and I was fascinated all over again, especially by my underlying, underlining, underlying passages, which I almost never do to a book, even if it is my own. But this had quite a quantity. So I figured I was looking at the me of many, many years ago when I saw them. Isley is not only a notable scientist, he is a beautiful writer. As one commentator put it, the immense journey glows with the wisdom and the originality of a scientist who has produced, who has pondered the riddle of existence and possesses the eloquence to put his thinking into words. So here's another illustration of that literary genius. Isley is contemplating the skulls of a vanished race, race of human beings commonly called boss cups. Found in an isolated area of Africa, it illustrates that what the once existence of people with a human brain larger than possessed by any of us currently. The ratio of cranium to face in those people was five to one. For Europeans now, it is three to one. Which causes Isley to say, the need is really not for more brains. The need is for a gentler, a more tolerant people than those who won for us against the ice, the tiger, and the bear. The hand that hefted the ax out of some old blind allegiance to the past fondles of the machine gun as lovingly. It is a habit man with, will have to break to survive, but the roots go very deep. And this is him again. I once sat as a prisoner long ago and watched a peasant soldier just recently equipped with a submachine gun swing the gun slowly into line with my body. It was a beautiful weapon and his finger toyed incessantly with the trigger. Suddenly to possess all that power and then be forbidden to use it must have been almost too much for the man to contain. I remember also a protesting female voice nearby, the eternal civilizing voice of women who know that men are fools and children and irresponsible. Sheepishly, the man slowly dropped the gun muzzle away from my chest. The black eyes over the barrel looked at me, a little wicked, a little desirous of better understanding. Thompson, Tommyson, he repeated proudly, slapping the barrel. Thomason, I nodded a little weakly, relaxing with a sigh. After all, we were men together and understood the great subject of destruction. And was I not a citizen of the country that had produced this wonderful mechanism? So I nodded again and said carefully after him, Thompson, Thompson, bueno, si, muy bueno. We looked at each other then smiling, a male smile that ran all the way back to the Ice Age. In academic halls since considering the future of humanity, I have never been quite free of the memory of that soldier's smile. I weigh it mentally against the future whenever one of those delicate forgotten skulls is placed upon my desk. I think of Isley's observation when the great powers of our modern world hold conferences to discuss some reduction in the number of atomic bombs each of them shall retain. But the other rather startling discovery I made on rereading this book, The Immense Journey, was that I, 
I had all those many years ago accepted his premise that human life came to its present status on Earth through a long process, an immense journey from the original lowly cells to me and to you. Other fancier descriptions of how we get here are wonderfully imaginative, even poetic images, but the reality is, I think, less romantic. I long ago bowed out of the arguments about whether God created man in his own image. And this morning, I go once again to Isley. Quote, we are one of the many appearances of the thing called life. We are not its perfect image, for it has no image except life, and life is multitudinous and emergent in the stream of time. This is the stuff that shivers my religious timbers. <laughs> For others, it's music, and still others, the satisfaction of social action that makes a difference in our communal life. Another of the benefits of belonging to this fellowship was in the religious education of our children, and the determination then and now provides an inspiring variety of programs. It is a really important aspect of our religious life. I, just believe, for, I believe it is important for children to have a religious home perhaps especially in a community such as this one. They need a sense of their own belonging and a reliable source of support to give them comfort when they are plagued by a world that sometimes accosts them. When one of our daughters who applied, I don't know how old she was, what, 14, 15, to join Rainbow Girls, one of the supervising adults objected to her membership on the grounds that she was a Unitarian and Unitarians don't believe in God. Quote, they don't believe in God, end quote. Well, I sent a message back in one of my unchristian moments asking that if what God she was talking about, as described by St. Augustine as the God of all being, or by a later description by another, I think maybe Paul Tillich, God himself, or maybe the descriptions were the other way around. My daughter became a radio girl without further discussion. Admittedly, it was not one of my most stellar ecumenical performances, but it illustrated for me the necessity that we provide our own religious education for our children, that we equip them with the faith of this church and this denomination to deal with the world, which is surely going to accost them. So it is alternately amusing and exasperating to meet someone who, impl who implies I belong to some newfangled church, probably an annex to the Democratic Party or maybe to the ACLU. Then I get to tell them about Michael Servetus, who centuries ago, in addition to disputing the biblical foundation for the concept of the Trinity, he also wrote a very accurate piece about how the blood circulates in the body. Of course, that wasn't discovered for another 100 years or more because Calvin burned him at the stake along with every book he could get his hands on. There are, in fact, only two of Servetus's books that are still existence, and one of them is a heavily audited one that belonged to Calvin. <laughs> then I add what I'm telling him about my church, the five presidents of the United States that have been Unitarian Universalists, starting with Thomas Jefferson. Well, that slows it down a little. Then there are lots of other variations you can use depending on who it is you're trying to convince. Now, almost 70 years after this church was established, I haven't changed my mind about where I belong or, or why I belong. While it is sometimes an interesting exercise to imagine your life if you'd made some other choice, I cannot picture my religious life on any other path than this one the Unitarian Universalist one. It may be the one less traveled by, but for me it has made all the difference. And I see that we actually have time to have a discussion. Isn't that good? I think it would be important for people here to know about the book that you shared with another author. It was here in our library. And I think it would be good for you to put, for people to borrow it, at least look at it. Well, it, I really got into that because, because I taught in the church school and I was teaching. I, for numbers of years, I taught a course called The Church Across the Street. And it has a, 
uh, it has a description of the major denominations, and we would we studied the Catholic Church, and then we went to Mass, and then on the next Sunday, and then we following Sunday we came back and said, "What did you learn, and what are your questions?" And we did that for the Presbyterians, the Lutherans. You know, it was an interesting exercise. But I the I started with the book starts too. I start. It's called the Church Across the Street. And I started with the Catholic Church, of which I had a multitude number of questions, many of which I got from the kids. And, I, and so I would go down the hill to my very Catholic neighbor. I loved her. She was a good friend of mine. She went to Mass every single morning of her life. And so I'd go down the hill and ask her questions. Well, one day she called me up and she said, you come down here and have coffee. So I went dutifully down to have coffee and she said, Monsignor is giving a course on Catholicism for non-Catholics, people who are not probably not interested in joining the church but want to know more about it. And I'm going to take you over and introduce you to Monsignor and then you can take the class or not take it, but don't you ever come down the hill and ask me one more question <laughs> about the Catholic Church. <laughs> that was in February. And I have to admit, for the first time in my life when I got to the cathedral, and the class was downstairs, and I'm going downstairs, and I'm thinking, this is spooky. <laughs> it was just me. So I was in that class from February until September. But some, in, the, in the interim, in the course of trying to find out more about the church so I could properly teach that class to the junior high kids, I found, went to the library, and I found a book called The Mouse Hunter, and it was written by a Catholic woman whose husband was an English professor in Notre Dame. And she had written three books by that the time I found the book, but it was one, it was informative, but was also lighthearted and very funny. So I wrote her a fan letter, and I got a letter back. So a while later, a question came up, and I wrote her another letter. Well, this went on for maybe three years, four years. So then I wrote her and told her what I was doing now. I was in this I was really going to learn about it, and I wouldn't have to ask her any more questions. And, and I got a letter back from her saying, maybe we have a book. If you can describe what you're learning and, what's, and not freeze up, maybe we have a book. So I thought, well, I never believed there'd be a book. So I just, you know, I'd come home on Tuesday night and stay downstairs till about 2 in the morning till my neighbor said, Betty, aren't you feeling well? You just look so tired some days. Well, you know, you stay up till 2 and get up at 6.30 and you're going to look tired. But it was published up to my great astonishment. It was called Mind If I Differ. And it, you know, it sold a fair number of copies. It hardly became a bestseller, but it changed my life. I became the most popular speak speaker in Bismarck for a lot of clubs. The Lullaby Club, the, you know, that year afterwards. It was fun. I met lots of people in Bismarck I wouldn't have met otherwise. And I got wonderful fan letters. Some of them telling me they hoped I didn't mind being wrong because they thought I was probably a nice person underneath it all. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I went to my first district Unitarian meeting in Des Moines, Iowa. And I walked into this cocktail hour and the first person I met said, you're the one that wrote the book. And I was in, you know, I, could, I couldn't have taken a puppy and done any better as a way of introduction. <laughs> So it it was it changed my life in many ways. I spoke to the I got on a train and went to Fargo and spoke to the the Catholic it was it's the Catholic youth group of the college, which was really interesting, I thought. And a good friend of mine from who I'd gone to college with many years ago came to the meeting because I was going to stay at her house that night. And she, <laughs> a woman said, "What do you Unitarians think?" of the soul, and I'll try that. Somebody asks you to define the soul <laughs> with the 150 people sitting out in front. And I said, well, I said, I think if I tried to describe it, you'd probably think it was, I was doing something in psychology. And she said, I don't believe in psychology. Well, that just tickled my friend, no doubt. She said, that's like saying you don't believe in gravity. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience in my life, I have to admit. And there is a copy of the book. We've lost numerous copies over the years. Um, uh, it seems to me that Unitarian Universalism really like challenges the very concept of religion itself. I mean, like in what way? I think like the most 
outside of academia, the vast majority of people believe that religion requires, like necessarily requires the belief in the supernatural. I mean, like in what way can a person be religious but be a physicalist, materialist, naturalist who does not believe in anything supernatural at all? And um, I mean, I think that for the vast majority of people is like that doesn't, that's oxymoron, it doesn't make any sense. Can you be religious and not believe in the supernatural? <laughs> that seems obvious to me that you can because being religious is so much more than, than belief in a supernatural. I don't think that's a requirement at all. I think being religious has to do with how you treat other people and, 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 and the world we live in, our responsibility to, to the world. I just don't, I mean, some people believe in, some, some, in the supernatural and some don't, and I don't think it defines religion necessarily. Betty, uh, has, has there been a time when you've questioned your Unitarian Universalism? No, I don't think so. That's cool. I, you know, I, I grew up surrounded by people, well, I, in the little country grade school I went to, that was, the, most of the other kids were Catholic. And they were the children of immigrants, and the Catholic Church was the one real basis of their life. After all, church was said in Latin, and so they, you know, it was very important. And they told me with great regularity I was going to hell because I wasn't a Catholic. And you know, I solved that by going to my Unitarian father, <laughs> and I asked him, "Do you believe in hell?" And he said, "No." He said, "But I try to live so in case there is one, I'm not in any trouble." <laughs> And that survived me to whatever else. That was the perfect answer I could use it for. <laughs> it was all right what I chose to do, as long as I didn't get in any trouble. <laughs> and I, I just never have questioned it once I found it. It was it, with the first year or two that we, there were, you know, eight, ten, maybe we got up to 15 members finally at first until the first oil boom hit North Dakota. And then we were just flooded. That's when we built this building. Because uh, we had geologists and what have you and people who had belonged to the Unitarian Church in San Antonio. And it was a very exciting time. And, and uh, so, but for, at first it was just a small gag. And we'd find a new book and boy, we'd bring it to church on Sunday morning. Everybody is so excited. Can I, have, can I read this next? You know, it, was, it was an interesting time. As you prepare to leave this sacred space, pack away a piece of this church in your heart. Wrap it carefully like a precious gem. Carry it with you through the joys and sorrows of your days. Let its gentle glow strengthen you, warm you, remind you of all that is good and true. Until we gather here again in this place of love. Go in peace. Celebrate. Celebrate. Celebrate.